Hi and welcome back. In this series of four videos, I'm going to go through in detail every single supplement, treatment or intervention I've tried in five years of suffering with long COVID. I'm going to talk about the current theory, rationale or science for why each might be effective and then discuss my experience with it before sharing what the anecdotal reports are from others who've tried it and whether I still think it's a relevant part of the toolbox today. I'm going to chat to each of them, so if there's anything you're particularly interested in, you can just skip straight to it. I also want to give a quick shout out to the fact that I've started channel memberships, with which you get three-day early access to new content, priority response to comments, and members-only live Q&As, the next of which being Monday the 19th of May at 6pm UK time. I've set membership to the minimum YouTube will allow at 99p. If you're interested, the link is below and in the description. Now back on topic, um, it goes without saying, but I have to say it anyway, that several of these treatments are of course prescription only, and for the ones that aren't, I have to insist that you speak to your doctor before trying them. I personally am not a doctor, and I am explicitly not recommending anything that I talk about in this list, rather talking about my experiences with them and the experiences I've heard from others to help people make the best informed choices about whether something might be worth talking to their doctor about. So let's crack on with two of the most controversial treatments for long COVID, ivermectin and help apheresis. Now, ivermectin was a hot topic back in the early days of long COVID, 2020 and 2021, but rightfully, in my opinion, has faded from the conversation since then. Well, what was the logic for why it might have been helpful, though? Some researchers hypothesized that ivermectin could help long COVID by binding to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, inhibiting viral reproduction, which would be relevant, of course, in the case of ongoing persistence. And it would also have anti-inflammatory properties that could inhibit cytokine production. However, all of this was just theory, and at best based off petri dish experiments, rather than actually any in vivo experiments. And as for my experience, when I tried it four years ago, there was potentially a transient improvement in symptoms that could quite easily have been the placebo effect before I had a huge and quite dangerous eosinophilic reaction, which was basically an extreme drug allergy, and that put me in hospital for a week. And I'm not the only person to have ended up in hospital after taking ivermectin. So what are my broader thoughts? Well, I don't think time has been particularly kind to the early hype. So moving on. Help apheresis, another controversial treatment, mostly because of its expense and invasive nature and some pretty bad experiences some patients have had when a femoral catheter is used uh, to actually do the treatment itself. What does it actually involve though? Well, it's basically a process of filtering your blood to get rid of macro and micro clots and excessive fibrinogen. It's a treatment that was originally uh, developed 40 years ago, pretty much, uh, to deal with people who had extremely high cholesterol levels. Your whole blood volume is filtered through a machine before being put back in again. And at the end, you get to see all the stuff that's come out in the filter. Normally, you'd use the veins in your arms where blood is normally taken from, but apheresis requires big needles. And people with harder to access veins uh, find themselves in that position where they have to use the catheter in the femoral vein in the groin. The scientific rationale for applying it in the context of long COVID suggests that the removal of fibrinogen can immediately improve the oxygen supply in the capillaries, so quote marks for stuff I'm pulling from the research, uh, and help restore the vascular homeostasis, remove inflammatory and thrombogenic mediators. Uh, more research shows that apheresis can reduce neurotransmitter autoantibodies, inflammatory markers, and improve rheology by decreasing fibrinogen levels and erythrocyte rouleau formation. In a nutshell then, cleaning up the blood that in many cases uh, is seeming to do a pretty bad job of delivering oxygen to the tissues in long COVID. So what about my experience? I had 10 sessions of apheresis over multiple visits to Germany in 2021. For the avoidance of doubt, I did not have apheresis on my visit to Cyprus in 2023. 
Aphoresis is quite a thing. You sat in the chair for about three hours and it's pretty uncomfortable. Uh, once I got unplugged though and I could get up, I felt like I had a real freshness, a clarity of thought, somehow feeling like all of that toxic crap had been swept out of my body. And it genuinely did feel like that for me. And one word on that toxic crap, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that long COVID can create havoc with your blood because I saw some of the clots that came out of other long haulers in the clinic. And we're not talking microclots here, but pencil length and thickness, gooey, rubbery clots that came out of their veins. I'm actually still genuinely amazed that the body can somehow still survive when there's that degree of coagulation going on. Now, of course, not everybody has that severity of coagulation going on, but certainly in some cases, we are seeing that in long COVID. So anyway, a few hours after the session, tiredness set in, but it kind of felt like an old fashioned healthy tiredness as opposed to that kind of awful, sort of grim exhaustion that comes with long COVID. Um, I slept quite a lot over the next couple of days and then three or four days after the first session, you can have another. I'd return from Germany after each trip, definitely feeling better than I did when I went out. Uh, the drive home was easier and I'd have to stop and rest less. Overall, several weeks after my last session, I was definitely doing better overall. I had more energy, more cognitive clarity and more spoons generally. However, in January 2022, I caught COVID for the second time, and that pretty much sent me back to square one. And after that point, I didn't go back for more. So longer term judgments on its effects for me, unfortunately, isn't really possible. As for the broader picture and the stories I've heard from the community, now this is aside from the potentially serious complications connected to femoral catheter use, which I won't address here other than to say I wouldn't personally do that. Um, the general picture is, on balance, fairly positive. Some people report dramatic improvement in some of their worst symptoms, although I have to say that full recovery or remission, whilst occasionally reported, is still relatively rare. The majority report smaller incremental improvements to a variety of symptoms, and it also does have to be mentioned that there's a significant number of people who report no improvement at all. So likely what we're seeing here is a reflection of the heterogeneity of the patient group and exactly what the complex pathology is on an individual basis, which determines who responds. And that's going to be the case pretty much for every treatment I talk about in this series to a greater or lesser extent. It also has to be pointed out that if we assume viral or spike persistence as a root cause, then apheresis doesn't actually solve the underlying problem, just provides a temporary fix to some of the downstream problems. Again, to be clear, I'm not recommending apheresis as a treatment. That has to be an individual decision made in consultation with your doctor. So next, vaccination. And again, more controversy. Uh, but before diving into this subject, I do want to be clear that I'm not addressing uh, the subject of vaccination causing long COVID-like symptoms in a significant minority of people. Rather, I'm talking about what vaccination could do for people already suffering from infection-induced long COVID. What's the logic for it? Well, vaccines may help with long COVID through several mechanisms, including potentially clearing persistent virus, interrupting autoimmune responses, or resetting the immune system. What was my experience? Much like the majority, a rubbish few days before returning plus or minus to baseline. And everyone else's. I made a few videos back in the day based on research I did that showed that in a nutshell, about 25% thought it made their baseline worse, 50% said vaccination made no difference after that dodgy first week, and 25% said it improved their symptoms with a very, very small number reporting complete remission. Now, all of this is somewhat historical because the most important question is how do long haulers stand with vaccines now? The rationale for taking them as a prophylactic against catching COVID itself is more or less gone, as current vaccines don't protect you from getting infected, they just mitigate how serious that infection might be. And on balance, my personal perspective is that putting more spike into your body via mRNA vaccines probably isn't a good idea. However, when we get the nasal vaccines or non-mRNA alternatives, that situation might change and vaccination might come back onto the table as something that could possibly help long COVID symptoms. Now, something a little less controversial, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or HBOT, where you get into a pressurized tank and breathe oxygen, the pressure forcing that oxygen deeper into your tissues. The potential benefit stems from multiple mechanisms, including, and I quote, 
enhanced mitochondrial function, reduction in inflammation, mobilization of stem cells, improvement in thrombotic disease, and the relief of hypoxia, which is uh, poor levels of oxygen in the tissues. It could potentially address the hypoxia, neuroinflammation, and vascular dysfunction that we think are underlying some long COVID symptoms. I've done quite a lot of HBOT in various settings, so soft tanks, hard tanks, and large diving tanks. My best experiences came from the solo hard tanks at a pressure of two atmospheres. It doesn't hurt that you're forced to lie down with no stimulation and concentrate on your breathing for an hour, of course, but after every session I'd get out feeling almost like a normal human. Headaches gone, cognitive clarity and energy back. I generally feel pretty good for the rest of the day, but the benefits waned after that until I had the next session. Unfortunately, you have to factor in the expense of the treatment itself and the energy spend of actually getting to the place to have it. Soft tanks at home can be a solution, but they only have limited pressure they can reach, which limits the effectiveness of the treatment. At the end of the day, I felt like I'd need to have a hard tank in my house for it to be a long-term solution, and that wasn't practical, so I've generally stopped doing it. Although, if you offered me a chamber right here, right now, I would, of course, gladly hop in. Other long haulers' experiences are generally pretty similar. Short-term benefits, but not necessarily anything that sticks around long-term. We have had one study that looked at HBOT versus long COVID, and it found improvement from a small sample, but again, no long-term follow-up. My verdict would be that it can be a very useful adjunct, but it isn't going to make you better long-term all by itself. Paxlovid, the antiviral that sprung to life as the first effective treatment for acute COVID. Logic would dictate then that surely if there was viral persistence, it would work to knock that out too. Sadly, it seems not. We've now had two clinical trials draw a blank on its efficacy for long COVID, one very recently from Yale, which suggests that either A, viral persistence isn't a thing, or B, if it is, Paxlovid can't find it or do anything about it. Which, to my mind, is rather more likely, because if there is persistence, it's not all happening in the same places that an acute infection is. I tried a six-day course of Paxlovid two or three years ago. Um, the side effects were horrible, and I got to day six being unable to tolerate taking any more. Um, it didn't affect my long COVID symptoms in any way once I finished that course. This is a story that's also common to the other long haulers I know who've tried it. So, nice idea, but better luck next time with perhaps the next generation of antivirals. Methylene blue. This is a salt that's also used as a dye and, surprisingly, also a medication. Most notably for a rare blood condition that affects how red blood cells deliver oxygen, and also, historically, for malaria. The logic for its use in long COVID is that it could enhance oxygen delivery to tissues by improving haemoglobin function and thus improve metabolic and mitochondrial function and then energy levels. It could also act as a potent anti-inflammatory by inhibiting both free radical production and, in principle, cytokine storms through far too complex to explain in this video metabolic pathways. I tried it for a couple of weeks and it definitely had an effect. I felt extra wired and certainly more alert. However, it didn't feel particularly natural and it played absolute havoc with sleep, which over time led to an overall detrimental effect. Ultimately, I didn't like what I felt it was doing to my nervous system and I figured it wasn't worth continuing, as at best it was a haphazardly aimed sticking plaster with unknown long-term consequences. Dosing is also quite hard to judge and you have to be careful about where you source it from as some forms are toxic. I only know of a few reports from people on social media saying it helped them, but no one saying it led to long-term drastic improvements and certainly not when they stopped taking it. For me personally, it's one I'm glad to have knocked off the list, but I won't be taking it again in a hurry. So to keep the length of these vids down, I'm gonna call time on this one here, but still to come in the next installments, this side, all this stuff. Um, it's also possible that over the last five years, I've tried so much, I've forgotten some of it. So if there's something that you'd like to see me talk about, then let me know in the comments because there's a good chance I have tried it too and I can add it into the next videos. Five years, after all, is a long time with brain fog. And also, if you've got any questions for the members Q&A on Monday, then chuck those in the comments too. Look after yourselves, as always. Until next time.